And I am also getting it set to go on YouTube. So, so welcome everyone. We're gonna give it just a minute or two as folks start popping in. Thanks for joining us. Awesome, and we are also live on YouTube. Great, so thank you everyone for joining us. We're gonna give it just a few, another minute or two before we get started. So everyone has an opportunity to hop on. <clears throat> Looks like we have a pretty steady stream of folks still coming in. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started um, and we'll just let some people start trickling in. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Felicia and we're gonna hear from a great group of folks today. We're really excited to have you here with us. Um, and to get us started, I'm actually going to play a very quick video from the director of the program, Deborah Monk, um, who is maybe there in the background, but unable to join us fully in person today. So I'm gonna start off with that video and uh, we'll go from there. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are so excited that so many of you have signed on to hear this conversation with Mike Arcega, Jennifer Starkweather, Amanda Hewen, and Jenny O'Dell, and our wonderful moderator, Victor Yanez Lascano. My name is Deborah Monk. I'm the director of the Artist in Residence Program at Recology San Francisco. I use she, her pronouns. So tonight we will hear from four incredibly talented artists for whom research is an integral part of their practice. And I've been doing my own research this past year on issues around systemic racism, embedded societal inequalities, and the history of the egregious land acquisitions in the United States. I'd like to thank my team, Felicia, Elsa, and Victor for guiding me on this journey of discovery and understanding, um, specifically to learn more about this place I've called home for 40 years, which is in San Francisco. With that, I would like to begin tonight's panel by acknowledging the ancestral and unceded land of the Ramatush Ohlone people who are still living in the Bay Area. I, I offer this acknowledgement respectfully and with gratitude, recognizing that after doing my own research, I still only know a little. Uh, they have lived and continue to live in a way that respects, conserves, and protects the land and animals. It's what we aim to do at Recology. But it's important to remember that the stewardship of the land and the regenerative practices of indigenous peoples are the bedrock of our modern notions of sustainability. So I encourage you to do your own research and learn about the land you live on and the history of the indigenous peoples. If you'd like to uh, learn, if you'd like to offer your land acknowledgement, please put it in the chat. And if you'd like to learn more about land acknowledgements, we have two links for you. One is an interactive map of native lands. And the other is the Museum of Us, which I've just newly di discovered. It's a wonderful museum, but they have a lot of information on land acknowledgements. So those two links will be in the chat. I'd like to go back to my team and recognize how incredibly talented they are. Um, as Felicia says, it's a small but mighty team. Um, Felicia is the program supervisor for the Artists in Residence program and the Educational Tour program. And Elsa Haru is the education specialist, both of whom will be working behind the scenes. Micah Gibson, of course, who does our design and video work, 
and tonight's moderator, Victor Yanez Lascano. I would also like to thank the panelists. I am honored to know all of you and to have had the opportunity to work with you during your residency and to learn so much from your varied practices and bodies of work. So thank you again to everyone for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> awesome. So thank you so much, Deborah, from afar for that wonderful introduction. And again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, again, my name is Felicia Castaneda. I'm the supervisor for the Artist in Residence and Educational Tour Program. Um, and I'm just gonna kick us off by giving a brief background of the, the company and the Artist in Residence Program. So uh, to start off, Deborah mentioned, we have a very small but mighty team. You heard from Deborah just now, she's, who's the director of the program, myself, um, and then Elsa will be working behind the scenes. And then our program tonight will be moderated by Victor Yanez Luscano, um, who works uh, with us as well and is a past uh, artist in residence. So for those of you who don't know, Recology is a private employee owned resources recovery company for the city of San Francisco. We do actually operate it throughout the West Coast in Washington, Oregon, and throughout California providing services like picking up the recycling, compost, and landfill-bound materials from homes and businesses throughout the communities where we serve. Uh, the program, the Artists in Residence program celebrated its 30th anniversary last year at the same time that Recology as a company celebrated our 100th anniversary, which is very exciting. Uh, this program, the, the AIR program was founded by an artist and activist named Jo Hansen, who had a street sweeping practice in front of her home in the Lower Haight. She would collect materials that she found and eventually expanded this practice to include community members, uh, youth, and, and caught the attention of the city who brought her out to the Recology Transfer Station to see where the materials she was collecting were ending up. When she saw the amount of resources being thrown out, she thought it could be such a wonderful opportunity for artists, and that was how the program was born. So we are super thankful for the vision that she had. The program is, is still rooted and still very much the same of what she envisioned um, nearly 30 years ago. And so it's just it's just a wonderful uh, a wonderful program that she dreamt up and uh, also just a great um, a great example of how one person's idea or one person's actions can really impact uh, so many people. Um, I'd also like to give thanks to our board members who do so much for the program. They review hundreds of applicants uh, and go through and make sure that we select the best artists for the program. Um, so we're very thankful for them. We've had over 200 artists come through the program here in San Francisco, and it's been a whole range of artists, so sculptors, um, painters, photographers, digital media, uh, mixed media, performance artists, um, it, they spend, they typically spend four months scavenging through the public reuse and recycling area, which is your traditional public dump, and uh, they get to work in a studio space on site and then have a final exhibition uh, that spans just three days. So it's really a whirlwind. Uh, those four months fly by, um, and we are just so lucky to have been able to work with uh, such a myriad of different types of artists. This past year, of course, has been a bit challenging, but also very exciting. We've had to transition all of our programming to the virtual setting, like I'm sure many of you have. Uh, but what's been really amazing about this is that it's allowed us the opportunity to really connect with a lot of our past artists uh, and to reach more people. So we have been providing webinars. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the artist program or more about recology and recycling, we offer monthly webinars. We also have started a workshop series with past artists, so you can find those on our YouTube channel. Uh, and we are very active on our social media as well. Uh, we have another panel coming up in June uh, that is going to be very exciting. These are the artists, uh, Abel Rod Rodriguez, Sibel Lyle, Terry Burlier, and Jamil Ailu will be on that panel. Um, and that panel is titled, um, if I can remember, we just came up with it. Um, all in queer intersections. So it'll be a celebration of Pride Month um, and a really engaging conversation with these four artists. 
So before I, uh, we dive into the panel, I just want to say that, again, we are very active on all social media. If you uh, don't already, I would encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, uh, where you'll learn about all of our upcoming events, panels, webinars, workshops. Uh, you can also find our past panels and our, all of our workshops on our YouTube site at Recology AIR. Um, and we'll always update our uh, websites as well, so you can check us out there. Great. So with that, I would like to introduce our very wonderful moderator for tonight, Victor Yanez Lascano. Um, Victor is a staff member and a former uh, artist in residence. He had a solo, his exhibition Long Division ended in late January of 2020. His exhibition focused on the use and subtle transformation of materials that are directly related to manual labor. This work further expanded his research on how language and labor have contributed to the formation of his family's US-Mexican immigrant identity. Inspired by oral histories and firsthand accounts, his work utilizes photography, video, performance, sculpture, and installation to poetically chronicle the varying de degrees of assimilation occurring within his family. Victor holds an MFA in art practice from Stanford University a BFA in photography from Columbia College, Chicago, and since 2008 has passionately been involved in art education. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Victor. And again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Felicia. And thank you, Elsa. I come to you tonight from the traditional homeland of the Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee along the Southwest shores of the Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kanikinik rivers meet and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. Native folks are still here. Before we begin, I'd like to invite all of you in the audience to submit any questions you might have throughout the presentation in the Q&A dialogue box below. At the tail end of the talk, we'll open up to audience questions and I will cut, I will select questions from there. Also, at certain points throughout the talk, we will paste a link into the chat for you to reference an image or a project as each artist responds to the questions. Over the last several weeks, I had the honor of sitting with the works of and visiting with each of tonight's panelists. The depth, breadth, and commitment of their respective practices consistently brought to mind the importance of maintaining one's curiosity for the ever-changing world around us while not forgetting to keep close and in hand a reliable compass of criticality, compassion, and lightheartedness. It has been nothing short of wonderful to have been tasked with finding the overlaps in the works of tonight's guests. I'm joined today by Jenny Yodel, Amanda Hewen, Jennifer Starkweather, and Mike Arcega. For tonight, each artist has prepared a short introduction so as to provide us a little bit of background on the creative practices. I'm now going to pass the mic over to Jenny Yodel, Jenny, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, and uh, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So um, I also just wanted to say um, that putting these slides together was an opportunity for me to just get really nostalgic about being at Recology. Um, I think that my residency there was the, probably like one of the most unequivocally positive experiences of my life. So um, it was just really nice thinking about how much it's influenced my work since then and my thinking. Um, so yeah, I am starting with a super old um, piece here because I think that it actually relates a lot to what I ended up doing at Recology. Um, this is the first collage I made from satellite imagery from Google Earth while I was in grad school at uh, the San Francisco Art Institute. And, um, and it's 144 empty parking lots. This kind of started as an experiment because I grew up in San Jose and I remember being surrounded by empty parking lots. And so it was sort of this like visual uh, thought experiment of like, what would it look like if I put them all together? Um, but I... I, I tried to recreate this on this slide, the kind of moment that I had when I first cut out one of these parking lots, because I remember sort of laughing out loud at the absurdity of this parking lot in this void. And I think this really comes back in uh, what I ended up you know, doing with uh, my work at Recology, um, which is like sort of what happens when you isolate something that seems familiar. 
Um, and oftentimes like something really specific about it comes into focus. And that's one of the reasons I've always enjoyed working this way. Um, and thinking about context, like what happens when you take something out of context, basically. Um, so yeah, basically, you know, these are, this is 2010. Um, so towards the end of grad school for me and then on, um, I made a, a long series of these pieces that are cutouts from Google Earth. And, uh, and I, without really deciding it intentionally at the beginning, I only ever collected man-made um, features. So I didn't, you know, I don't have like mountains or rivers or anything. It's like something really artificial, like swimming pools, um, water slides. I mean, this in particular is kind of a good example of that absurdity, like thinking about the amount of engineering that goes into constructing something so that we can go down a slide and end up in a pool of water. Um, and sort of over time, these started to drift in the direction of the infrastructural. I think because infrastructure as a category is kind of something that is really easily overlooked. And I, I found that what I was trying to do was look at the overlooked. Um, and so infrastructure naturally interested me. Um, it's also something that's like easier to get a hold of from an aerial point of view sometimes. Um, so these are those circular farms that you might see in really arid parts of the US. Um, these are uh, waste parts of wastewater treatment plants. Um, one of my favorite things to do when I visit a new city is go to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and this is just to kind of give a sense of like, you know, these are fairly large images when they're, they're physically produced and printed out, even though the resolution um, is, you know, screen based resolution. Um, yeah, and so and so this, you know, I have a lot of these collections, but I just kind of want to show this this movement towards the infrastructural and also this piece in particular is when I kind of started running up against this conceptual limit with the idea of infrastructure, which is um, if these are shipping containers, it's quite possible that these some might appear twice in here because shipping containers are moved. Um, and, you know, you don't necessarily know when an area has been imaged. Um, and so I was kind of starting to think more about networks um, as things that move other things um, and that, you know, there's not really a good way to produce like a frozen picture of a network. Um, and so something that I, I did around, this is in 2013, that really underscored that for me was I found out that all of the municipal power, uh, power used for municipal services like uh, firehouses, libraries, um, muni light rail in San Francisco, which is where I lived at the time, came from hydroelectric power um, produced at Hetch Hetchy which is quite far away. Um, and this is the most detailed map that I could find, which is not very detailed. And I just kind of became obsessed with this fact. Um, and so I just decided to look and trace this path myself again on Google satellite. Um, and then I generated a map of all of the places that the system crossed publicly accessible roads. Uh, I then generated a very long um, and convoluted set of driving directions. And then I went on this road trip and tried to document all of these different environments that the these transmission towers go through. And this is just kind of a small sampling of some of the different areas that I was, you know, chasing it through, including this town that's uh, everyone who lives there basically works on this um, water and power system and lives in these identical houses. Um, and you can see this like kind of pipe with the water coming down um, on the bottom left here. Um, but, you know, the, the point I think a lot about, like, what's the difference between knowing and looking at that map versus having gone on this trip and looked at it with my own eyes. And it has to do, I think, with a certain I was trying to learn how to read landscape and read um, structures for them to be sort of legible. So I think a lot about this kind of like tactility and legibility of systems. Um, after I did this project, I was flying back from Las Vegas and I saw the, the right of way that I had been tracing um, as this kind of like faint mark on the earth. And I was really sort of gratified that I was able to, to read that and sort of like know what that was. Um, again, because these things are often sort of hidden, hidden away. Um, and then also to just think about, you know, whenever I was taking the Muni light rail, um, that, that the movement of the train was concretely connected to the movement of water down this pipe that I had tried so hard to find. Um, so yeah, I sort of continued thinking about the infrastructural. I went back to satellite imagery and instead of cutting out little pieces, I started looking at larger systems. 
Um, so these are also kind of large prints. Um, and there's also still, again, this element of time and labor that went into these. Um, but it was also, there's something kind of insistent about them. Like, I always felt like I was sort of like poking at a wound or something because to, to sit and stare at these because they're often sites of extraction and pollution um, that are hidden from everyday consciousness, consciousness for anyone privileged enough not to live near them. Um, so this is actually not far from here. This is a giant oil refinery in Benicia. Um, and then this kind of brought up another conceptual problem, which is you can see, I don't really know where to cut off the pipes here. Uh, a friend of mine who's an architect said that this was actually the most interesting thing about this series was that you could see me dealing with the limits of um, trying to picture this system, which in reality is connected to, you know, oil rigs and ships and homes. Um, and so there, it really becomes this impossible task. So um, by the time I got to recology, I was kind of um, fixated on this question of uh, how can, is there a different way that you can picture a network instead of trying to actually show the whole thing, can you just use things that go through it to tell the story of the network? Um, and so that's kind of where I started out. And um, so this is what my studio looked like when I was there, um, the Bureau of Suspended Objects. Um, and uh, I'm sure this will come up, I, I'm gonna like just blow through this because I'm almost out of time, but I'm sure it'll come up in the questions. Um, basically what I created was a searchable archive of 200 um, objects that I researched the manufacturing origins of um, and then presented as essentially an archive, something that you could treat like a library. Um, and each of the objects had these little tags that you could scan with your phone and get all of the information that I had found. Um, there was also an augmented reality thing that I um, set up so you could see like the new version of the discarded objects that I had found. Um, and I'll just end by saying that uh, one really weird outcome of my project at Recology was that I no longer know how to, um, I don't know what trash is anymore. Um, when I, I went to Walmart shortly afterwards and it seemed like everything in the store was trash and the, the, the dump was full of products. Um, so it sort of taught me that either everything is trash from the minutes it's produced or nothing is trash and that becoming trash is just sort of like a psychological decision that we make at some point. Um, so yeah, that, that was a lot, but, um, I, uh, that hopefully that sums it up a little bit and I'll, I'll pass it on now. Um, Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jenny. We're going to go ahead and pass it to, uh, Jennifer and Amanda. Great. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. All right. Um, so I'm Amanda Hewen, and uh, we just quickly want to say thank you for having us tonight. And Jenny, we're also going to show a map of Hetch Hetchy, but uh, it'll be it's an interesting. It was great to see your work because we're also looking at infrastructure and in a different way. Um, and Jennifer. Um, I'm Jennifer Starkweather and together we are Hugh and Starkweather and we've been collaborating since 2006. Um, we both met while we had studios at the Headland Center for the Arts in Marin. And at that time we were making abstract work about landscape and the built and natural environment. Um, and from our very first collaboration together, um, our process has involved extensive research, um, generally about a specific place or topic, um, looking at ways that engineered human-made systems and structures interact with natural systems in the landscape. Um, to begin each project, which is generally site-specific, we visit archives, we read articles, books, and oral histories. Um, we do a lot of interviewing of community members and specialists. We collect historic photos and maps, and we look at data trajectories about possible futures. But when we start to put pen to paper, hints of the collected information show up in the work in, in recognizable forms. And perhaps as in this piece here, it's a landform or a topography or a built structure, 
but the work is always abstract and each artwork reinterpret, it really reinterprets the complex information and narratives that we've gathered and manifest through new and unexpected forms. So this work, of course, is about the Humboldt Bay watershed um, from our series, Shifting Shorelines. And you can clearly see here the, the outlines of the bay. Um, but it was also, what was also reflected in that piece um, in the forms and the marks and the abstraction was a story recounted to us in an interview with an environmental scientist about a treasured memory of hers um, of being momentarily lost in the dense fog at the beach um, in, at Humboldt Bay when she was a child. In this um, artwork from 2021 called Where Nature Had Not Intended, we were interested in what might happen to suburban developments built along tidal marshlands as sea level rises. And you can see in this aerial photo here of such a development reflected directly in the work. And by allowing the artworks to resonate with the data that we collect without presenting it in a didactic way, we hope to prompt a curiosity or a new perspective in the viewer and to communicate information that goes beyond numbers or data or words. And we're always wondering how can an abstract image invite a viewer to have a different kind of a reaction or understanding of a place or an idea? that goes beyond a fact. Um, so here's our Hetch Hetchy map. Um, and we've been really interested recently in the engineered water systems in California. Um, and obviously much of the fresh water that flows from streams and rivers into the Delta and the Bay and the ocean is funneled through this very intricate system of engineered canals, aqueducts, dams, um, and reservoirs. And a lot of our work um, is around climate change. So we're really interested in the consequences of climate change on water resources, but also on this aging infrastructure. And so as we look at the uh, past, present, and future of these engineered systems that are interwoven with these natural systems, um, we're translating this information into lines and shapes and colors in hopes of revealing more of a sensory, a visual, even an emotional um, aspect of this information. Again, trying to go beyond um, data and facts um, with this work. We were invited to be artists in residence at Recology in 2018 and specifically to to research compost. And we became interested at the same time in the food waste cycle and how most wasted food ends up in the landfill where it generates methane, a greenhouse gas, many times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Whereas compost on the other hand sequesters carbon and, and could be one of our greatest weapons in the fight to reduce the effects of climate change. So our research included visiting the Marin Carbon Project, um, an organization that studies how rangeland farming and agricultural practices can promote carbon sequestration. And this is a picture of the founder of the project, John Wick, who um, Deborah introduced us to. And for this project, we had to create a new visual language that was not rooted in a specific place. A lot of our work has to do with landscape or, or place. And so there was, we had to think about um, a new kind of uh, a, a way to communicate our ideas. Um, and so through research and interviews and reading, writing and brainstorming, this is just a collection of some of the examples of our research. We experimented with different ways to translate this information into shapes and colors and forms. And so as we were looking into this and we actually uh, researched this and were part of Recology for about a year. And um, we became really interested in, as Jennifer said, this cycle of food waste 
and investigating um, the disposal of all of this discarded food, but also the packaging and how much of that packaging is single use plastic and the tremendous impact this has on the environment. Um, so we scavenge some of this uh, single use plastic packaging, and then we would take these uh, things that we would find and we would trace them with ink uh, and pencil onto paper or wood. Um, so for example, some of these plastic green, you know, strawberry or tomato containers or a, a, a plastic lettuce clamshell, you can kind of see some of those in, in this piece and um, through repetition, create forms and compositions that uh, could possibly reference shifting landscapes or biochemical processes. Um, and with all of our works, we're not attempting to offer concrete information or solutions, but we want the viewer to get curious about um, this topic or this place um, and respond to it in a way that transcends data and numbers. And uh, we'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Jennifer and Amanda. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your work and thanks for having me here. Um, it's nice to see you all. Uh, launch my talk. Happen. Um, so um, my practice uh, or my, my, the research portion of my work is largely based on, um, on a kind of biography. Um, and I'm just gonna scroll through work that uh, leads to the current things that I'm, I've been looking at. Um, so this is me as a child going way back. Jenny thought she was going to bring up a, a piece that was <laughs> way back. I'm going back. So this is uh, me and my brother and my sister in a tricycle in the Philippines. Uh, this is my family on a banca, which is an outrigger canoe in the Philippines. Um, this is a thing I ate in the Philippines, spam lunch and meat. Um, and then we'll fast forward. Um, uh, this is a work that I made out of that material, Spam Lunch and Meat. Um, it's called Spam, Oce Spam Maps Oceana. I've been interested in language uh, because my biography being um, an immigrant Filipino, I speak Tagalog, bilingual, bicultural, um, and that has a lot to do with how I process information and how um, I conduct uh, my research as an artist. So this is a detail. Um, I became interested in uh, kind of colonial narratives uh, early on. Uh, this is a work that is under the umbrella of the El Conquistador project, uh, which is based on a historic trade route between um, Mexico and the Philippines ran by Spain. Uh, both were colonies and um, a lot of materials and people got and cultures got shared during this time. Um, and so uh, a project I did was to build a manila folder, manila galleon, and sailed it into Mollus Bay uh, to kind of replicate the manila galleon trade route. So I sailed to that island uh, way in the back there um, with help from many friends. Um, so this is it on display. And so fast forward, maybe a decade or so, I found myself in Richmond, Virginia, teaching at VCU. Um, and then I was kind of recounting things that I uh, learned about in grad school, about um, a paper uh, called The Body Ritual Among the Nasarima by Horace Minor. Um, and he spoke about, he wrote about the Nasarima uh, as though they were some, some strange people. And uh, one came to realize that the Nasarima is actually American backwards. And the wordplay in this, just like spam and maps, was something that resonated with me. So a strategy that I found intriguing and a strategy uh, in language that I, that I um, just was and enjoy, I enjoyed. Um, so living in Richmond uh, uh, and knowing that um, 
much of the narrative of the United States come from that moving west. I thought I would then study, uh, and, and thinking about Lewis and Clark, I thought that I would study the people of the Nasirima because there had been so much text written upon, about them. And so uh, I created, um, I wanted to recreate that and I created a Pacific outrigger canoe out of the banca, similar to the one that we rode in the Philippines. Um, and this is, these are the process of, of making a kayak into a banca. Um, and then subsequently sailed it to maps. I guess this group likes maps. Um, sailed it across, starting with the James River, kind of founding river of the colonizers. Um, and uh, this is actually, we stopped at John Tyler's dock, the 10th president of the United States on the James River. And then, you know, this is in Pittsburgh, Maryland, Memphis, Louisiana, Texas, California, Oregon, around where Lewis and Clark kind of arrived at the, at the Pacific. Um, and so uh, this is the same kind of, oh, sorry. Uh, I collected things, artifacts from North America that had kind of these locative markers um, and created artwork with them. And one of the uh, projects um, that I did at Recology was to extend that research around the Nasarima and treating the, the dump as a kind of midden where I would collect things um, and then make narratives out of them. Um, and so that kind of, that, that moving through space and thinking about where I am and what I do um, as an artist is kind of researching community. Now, uh, in 2016, a large portion of San Francisco was deemed the cultural district for uh, Filipino, Filipino American um, communities called Soma Pilipinas Cultural Heritage District. And so in this work, I'm trying to uh, create, um, or actually this is a collaboration with Paolo Asuncion and we are trying to create um, a cultural marker that can, can establish a presence throughout the entire site. Uh, so we were looking at jeepneys, uh, ice cream carts, other tricycles, um, and we were able to purchase uh, a tricycle that was exported. Um, and uh, we had been um, kind of working to customize it. Uh, this is our friend Ming. Um, and kind of introduce it in the community as an object that then supports and represents a kind of Filipino-ness. Uh, this is ride, uh, protest rides, participating in food deliveries, uh, gift deliveries, um, and also we're doing karaoke, um, side karaoke, which is a side project that we're starting to conduct. We're doing beta tests with Jennifer Wofford, uh, Gina Mariko, uh, and so uh, Kapua Gardens. So we're, we're looking into the community as a kind of uh, primary source research. Um, and this is the work that I'm kind of um, transitioning towards with my collaborator as a filmmaker. So we're actually collecting narratives from the community. And by accident, we rode, not, we didn't ride by accident, but we rode with uh, North, NorCal Pinoy riders, a bunch of motorcyclists in the Bay Area uh, across the Golden Gate Bridge, and it became it went viral in the Philippines, and it's kind of causing this um, really interesting uh, dynamic in what it means to be a Filipino in America versus with a tricycle. Uh, they're calling this a historic moment, and and um, finding that new narrative in this work. So there you go. Awesome, thank you all so very much for those uh, very concise and precise presentations. Uh, <clears throat> so I just, uh, you know, that now that we got a very brief glimpse into each of your practices, uh, I kind of want to think through the theme of the, our panel, in particular, the, the term research. Um, and clearly we invited you all because uh, research is an essential component to your practice. Um, and now that we got to kind of see the intricacies of each one of your practices and how and what research looks like. I'm curious um, <clears throat> when it became an integral component to your practice. Um, and maybe more importantly, 
how do you communicate to your audience, whether it's a student or a layman, the importance of research as practice? And we can go ahead and start with Mike and then whoever wants to answer after that. Um, I've, I've kind of expanded my idea of research um, since going to grad school. Um, you know, I, I did classic research as in with books and, and data and um, things that one learns. Uh, but I, I think since then I realized that I could be a little bit more frivolous with research, counting research uh, like cooking or eating with friends or playing with a material, um, mostly, and, and in, this, in the case of the work that I'm doing now, actually interviewing people and um, hearing stories and, and kind of not um, allowing or allowing things to kind of happen naturally um, and following a kind of instinct, an instinct to, and getting in touch with one's proclivities. You know, my, my lens has been um, through this kind of immigrant um, position where I'm trying to figure out where I am and who I am and what I am to other people. And so, um, and, and how, how my practice is shaped by that relationship. So it's this fluid um, way of thinking about how I learn um, apart from the material research that I love to make things. So that, that comes from um, play also as part of my practice. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Feel free, anyone can go ahead and jump in. It. I'll jump in. Um, from our, from, for Hugh and Stark, with our first collaborative project um, back in 20, 2006, um, since then, research has been a really key component to our practice. And our, and our first project together was a series of public artworks along Market Street in downtown San Francisco. And, and prior to that, I would say with our solo work too, research was not a um, prominent part of our practice. Um, but for these pieces, we create a series of site-specific abstract artworks based on built and natural systems of the area. And we've, we've stayed close to that same kind of process or model of working since then. And I like what I, what Mike said about being frivolous with research. Like we talk about our work uh, or the way we research as being like an early cartographer and more and more our research is kind of about um, relying on word of mouth information. So, you know, we try to reach out to a wide variety of people about specific topic or places. Um, we're interested in many different narratives um, you know, we are obviously not experts, we're not specialists, um, and we're following this trail of information um, through these kind of oral histories and personal interviews. And, um, and then these multiple narratives start to reveal certain ideas about a place or a topic um, that then we are translating into this abstraction for the viewer to then translate for themselves. So that's a really important moment for us is when the viewer can kind of take these abstract forms and knowing what they're about, then make their own um, translations of those. And I just wanna add one last thing too, in, in, to the second part of your question around um, working with students are in my teaching. So in my teaching, I always ask my students to integrate research into their creative process as a way to kind of deepen or broaden their understanding of a topic. And I, encur I think it encourages them and us to draw from other disciplines, like something that they're learning in a history class or an English class or a science class and to, to to extract that information into their own creative process as a way to kind of deepen and broaden their relationship with their subject, you know, with whatever it is that they're making art about. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I would also um, echo what Mike said about 
research as almost like just a way of being, right? I came across this journal entry of mine from a couple of years ago where I said, I must have been stoned or something because I said, what if you don't do research? You are the research. But I mean, I think there's like, you know, there's like something to that, right? Um, and I find that there's this thing that happens when you start to have a hunch about something and then everything seems to confirm your hunch. <laughs> like every movie you see, every conversation you have, um, you know, like every epiphany you have, like at the dentist's office, like everything just kind of starts to like spiral into this thing, right? Um, and so it's almost like just, yeah, sort of a way of inquisitive way of looking at things. But I will say that um, I feel like I, I learned a lot about how to research um, from being an English major for undergrad, um, particularly in the form of like reading against the grain. So like we learned a lot about, you know, like you read a text sort of knowing maybe what the author was intending, but you also read it for all these other things that are present in the text, like between the lines. Um, and I think like probably what happened when I got to grad school was I was just applying that to like things I found online. Um, so like secondhand imagery, like, you know, I didn't show that the other project I did in grad school, but it's like, I, I did a, a basically fake virtual road trip across the US via Street View and like Yelp reviews and YouTube videos. It'd be really hard now because there's like way more, but, um, and like taking those pieces of information at like seriously, almost as like, um, like text, like literary texts and like reading them in that way. Um, and I think like, that's kind of, uh, you can do that with anything. Maybe that's like what cutting something out allows you to do is like, um, you know, even, yeah, Mike, you were talking about like treating it as a mitten, right? Like the, the dump, right? It's like, what if you take on the mindset of an anthropologist towards everything in your house? <laughs> it's like something, you know, can drive you crazy, but, um, it's, it's a very interesting way of, uh, being in the world, I think. Awesome. And I think all three of you kind of mentioned something with regard to like, uh, you know, letting things happen naturally. And I like this idea of uh, research as a way of being. Uh, and it makes me think of, uh, you know, how each of your practices actively engage the public in different ways. And uh, with, with regard to your work at Recology, uh, Jenny, um, I'm thinking about how like the objects are on display and how the book that was produced after became kind of like the uh, art object that people got to leave with. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could each talk about, maybe we can start with you, Jenny, if you could talk about how your desire to engage with the audience entered your practice uh, and how it's evolved in your practice, uh, especially with regard to the kinds of narratives that are being told. Yeah, um, I mean, I think a lot about how when you're a really little kid and you find something weird, you have to show it to someone. Like, I mean, and I know, <laughs> I know for a fact that I was really obnoxious about that when I was little. Like I would just go up to random strangers and start telling them about something that I found. Um, and so I think like maybe like that some of it just comes naturally where like if you're really excited about something that is weird that you found, like for me anyway, that's just like you, that just contains the impulse to want to demonstrate it or something or you want someone else to feel the same way, right? Like you also want them to be as excited as you are. And so like the thing that I did at Recology is like, basically just trying to recreate for the viewer, like the feeling that I had when I would go into the pile. Like I want them to have the same experience and I want them to, to be as excited about these objects as I am. So it's really kind of selfish um, in a way, but, and I, and I went to such great lengths too. It's like, it's like, well, some people aren't gonna wanna use their phones to scan the tags. So I, I printed out every page of the book and like laminated it. So you could go and stand in front of the thing and read it, right? And then there's the book and then there's the, the Tumblr, which is like searchable by color and decade, like totally unnecessary, right? But it's like, I think it's like, I ultimately like, that's just psychologically, like what I want is like for someone to be as excited about it as I am. Should we go? Yeah, go for it. Um, Amanda and I were invited to create an installation for the Asian Art Museum um, about their permanent collection. And what we ended up doing is we interviewed about five or six people who worked there about, um, about a their favorite piece in the collection. 
And we asked them to describe the piece without us seeing it. And we recorded them, um, their, their responses to it. Um, and then we made drawings based on their recordings. And we weren't trying to, to illustrate their words, but really trying to, to draw or capture the, the, um, their memory or their experience of this particular piece. So we ended up in the, in the exhibition, we presented the drawings and the audio recordings in addition to a map that the public could take, the viewer could take, and then go and locate the actual piece in the collection. So it was a way to kind of, without us ever seeing it. So it was a way to kind of engage the viewer in this, in our entire, into our pri entire process. Yeah, and I think it goes back to, again, that idea of translation and the idea of what Jenny's talking about, like sharing something with the audience, like this sense of discovery. And I think for both Jennifer and for me, the research component of our work is, you know, I don't wanna use the word fun, but it is as important a part of our process as actually making the artworks. Like, in fact, I think we spend a lot more time researching and just geeking out on, you know, hetch hetchy and um, and compost and you know whatever topic we're involved with at the time. And you know, some of our projects have lasted for many years. We did a, a four year or five year project about the Bay Bridge as the old bridge was coming down and being demolished, and the new bridge was coming up and looking at all the intricate like political and um, uh, financial and, and you know, uh, environmental issues tied up with, uh, with this bridge and the Bay Area and you know, wanting to like share that, but in this different way, I guess, through, through abstraction. Um. I, I think about audiences kind of similar to how Jenny talked about sharing weird objects. Um, I have a weird, uh, my version is kind of like this dad joke thing where, you know, I, I, I have to say there's a compulsion to say a dad joke. Uh, I think it has to do about being a dad and being Filipino. But I, I see that, like the structure of my the output of my research is being similar to jokes as having a kind of delivery, a dialogue, and then uh, a punchline. And that punchline doesn't have to be funny. That punchline could be a, a flip of an idea or a, a kind of mental transportation of some something. Um, and uh, you know, with I did some benches in Chinatown where I wanted people to here in San Francisco, I wanted people to kind of both um, sit on this, this artwork, but also kind of transport themselves like pretending, they could pretend like they were on a cloud, they're shaped like clouds. Um, the tricycle work is similar in that I want them to have a dialogue with this object uh, upon contact in, in their minds, like maybe it's this mental, uh, uh, idea of what it is for them, if they have a relationship with it, then it would hearken back to another time. So uh, I, that's kind of like a punchline for me in, in that when, when the viewer then makes this connection and, and somehow turns it over in their head, uh, it might be funny, it might be sad, it might be um, you know, uh, some kind of reward. Um, is what I want audiences to experience. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for those lovely responses. Uh, <clears throat> it looks like we have one, one more, or time for one more question before we open it up to the audience Q&A. This time has flown by. Um, uh, and I guess, uh, you know, I'm thinking about uh, how you're all frequently speaking to a particular time in a particular place, uh, whether physical or virtual, and I know that Recology is uh, selecting artists that make work within the Bay Area, right? But I'm curious uh, <clears throat> how 
being from the Bay Area informs your, your research and informs your practice and what the significance of this location uh, bears on your practice and research. And we can start with uh, Hugh and Starkweather this time. Um, I think for us, from the very beginning of when we started collaborating together, we were out at the Headlands and, you know, we're here in the Bay Area, you know, on the this incredibly unique place of human histories and natural histories and looking at how those, I mean, out at the headlands, of course, you've got the military history, you've got um, this amazing ecological history, uh, Native American history, how have all those histories interacted? We're located on the edge of a continent, on the largest estuary in North America, multiple earthquake faults, the gold, I mean, there's just so much, um, you know, here and of course, then the gold rush is happening now with water and real estate and technology. And so I think being here, someone said to us recently, we were like, oh, should we do work about other places? You know, and someone was like, why would you, this is your place. Like, you, you know, there's so much here. You, you can just dig, dig, dig. And um, yeah, so I think it's a, a big factor for us. Um, being in the Bay Area really affects our work. Um, I can go next. I uh, Oh, unless Jennifer, sorry, I didn't want to. Go, Jenny. Oh, okay. Um, um, well, I, so I'm from Cupertino or Cupertino, San Jose. Um, and so I think like one weird way that it's influenced me is the, the you know, both of my parents worked um, for technology companies, basically. Um, I think it made me grow up with kind of a weird attitude toward technology. Um, and perhaps it gave me um, a sense of permission to subvert it sometimes or try to use it in ways that uh, didn't immediately present themselves. So um, I don't know, it's, it's a, sort of a subtle thing, but I think um, that I, yeah, my, my approach to using like digital media has like never been straightforward for that reason. Um, and then more recently, um, you know, like my, the book that I wrote in 2019 and all of my work since then, a lot of it's been about bioregionalism um, and like coming to learn about my, you know, local ecology. So now like it's more important to me as like a subject, um, like just as a place, like getting to know it. Um, I think we might have a link to the piece that I wrote about Cascadia as a bioregion, but um, it's been, I think like that's always humbling for anyone to start learning about that if you don't know anything, but for me, it's sort of extra humbling because I'm from here. So it's like very much like the thing that was in front of you the whole time suddenly becomes visible. Like it's very much that kind of feeling. Um, and I don't think I can ever move for that reason, even though it gets more and more expensive to live here. Uh, I'm gonna like hang out as long as I can um, because uh, yeah, my, my sort of work and approach is so much about investing like an absurd amount of time and attention into like one thing or one place or you know one area um and so i have uh, a lot of sunk costs here <laughs> so yeah but i also really love it so. yeah um i was drawn to the bay area um i i think there's something about being uh like a tourist uh it's just a, a beautiful place um but as i've spent um, time here, uh, I've grown to kind of love the artist community, love the Filipino communities. Just it's my my work right now has been about like diving deep into that. And so I have tried a couple of times to look for a place that I would like to live elsewhere. But the history, the communities, um, the resources, in the Bay Area is just really, you know, it's still really amazing. Um, so yeah, I failed a couple times to leave, and now, um, now I've kind of I'm settled to staying put, and um, it's kind of awesome. You guys, you you all are awesome, and you all are here. So why leave? <laughs> Thank you all. Um, so just a reminder, we're going to accept questions in the Q&A and I'm gonna pop in there just to see if anything uh, has appeared so far. 
Um, so give me a second as I read these real quick. Cool. So I'm going to start with this first question. Uh, this question's for Mike. Uh, how does the media coverage in Philippines line up with your practice? Is it more of a popular cultural understanding or does it tie into the fine art research world that is being discussed here? Yeah, it's it's more of the first, the, it's a popular culture thing. But um, what it made me realize though with this project is how meaningful it is to see uh, a kind of this this flip that I was talking about, how the Filipinos are used to seeing American things on their land, seeing like big battleships, spam, like malls, all of those things, jeepneys. Um, but for for a moment, you have like this distinctly Filipino thing on the Golden Gate Bridge, and it struck a nerve. Uh, we've been doing interviews with the uh, news uh, folks and articles just keep popping up and now they're so they're kind of uh, we're spending a lot of time fielding lots of questions so um, yeah it just means for my practice on this for our practice on this end um, that we're we're we have to be really conscientious about how it's being read there as well and to make it um, explicit that this isn't just a, a, a tricycle going over the bridge or it's not just a karaoke machine. Um, this is kind of this, this it's actually a, a, an art practice that is um, wanting to create or find or discover the shape of um, a community in the United States and how it fits within the larger um, culture. Cool, awesome, thank you, Mike. Um, this question I think is for all of you. Um, <clears throat> in your research, how do you navigate questions of indigenous knowledge, the handling of that knowledge? What, what does it, or what it means to think of research as a way of recognizing certain notions of the ownership of knowledge and respecting that? So anyone can go ahead and, and I read that verbatim, so I'm, if it didn't make sense, I can try to rephrase it. I guess I can say something sort of general, which is just that um, I think that I like to think of research less as um, like creating something from nothing or like a sort of achievement model of research and more as like just recognition. And I think like that includes recognizing like entire bodies of knowledge that already exist and like have existed. Um, so like, I mean, one example for me would be just like, you know, like learning about all of the techniques of, um, like fire use and fire management, you know, that have been practiced for, or, well, they were suppressed for a long time, but, you know, were practiced for a really long time. Um, and, uh, and all of the ways that that can bring about like different ways of looking at land and, you know, what's living on that land. And that's, I mean, that's you know, for me, that's just like learning about something that w is already known, right? So like, I guess I would just say like, it's, um, I think like if you have like a sense of humility um, and that you're, you know, I feel that I'm an interloper here, um, like both physically and like conceptually with this knowledge, um, then like research doesn't look the same way as like when we talk about like research with a capital R, right? Um, it, it feels more like just kind of like looking around um, and uh, and there there is that sort of like humbling aspect to it, I think. Go ahead, Mike. Um, I'm working on a project at, at San Pablo Park in Berkeley um, in the main um, spirit of the project is to make an analogy of protests and flowers as in flower power. Um, uh, but it's giving me an opportunity to look at um, how indigenous communities use those flowering plants early on. So I'm, I'm taking and, and not, you know, I'm, I'm learning about uh, these various ways of 
plant usage and wanting it to be legible for the greater public um, so that that can get passed on through this like permanent public artwork. So um, I, you know, I think, I think as artists, we, we want to respect that and we want to share that knowledge um, explicitly. Do you want me to take this? Um, so I think for us researching, research as we said has, has become less about data and facts and figures and more about um, uh, oral histories, personal narratives, personal stories and um, I think a lot of that for us has become about um, accepting uncertainty so that we're not trying to like solve a problem or, you know, take ownership of something or say, this is the answer. It's more about um, opening up to uncertainty of multiple narratives of, um, and, and then that leads to paying closer attention and hoping that maybe the viewer will pay closer attention. And then possibly that attention could lead to caring more about something like about a place or about compost and soil. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that somehow is this like arc of, of how we think about research and knowledge um, around that, I would say. Cool. And I'm just going to, while I wait for, oh, here we go. Got another question. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I guess, uh, what role does politics play in your work? Does your work change shape as some of the values your work illuminates uh, is or is not supported by state or national leadership? Mm -hmm. Anyone want to take that? Sure. Go ahead, Mike. Um, yeah, I, my, my work in its core looks at um, a kind of power dynamic and wants to highlight it um, historically. That's kind of a, another subtext that's uh, running through. Um, I do delineate um, a kind of inside gallery practice versus a, a public art practice. Um, and the public art practice often is supported by other funds and, um, and, and is, is made for a different reason. It's a, it's a, for, it, it has to be legible, it has to uh, be uplifting. Um, it's less critical, um, whereas my gallery work can do that. It, it can be pointed and it can be um, uh, a little bit more direct um or satirical so yeah i think i think there there is a place uh in time for certain strategic political gestures anyone else want to hop on that question or we get um i would briefly say that um for us we were definitely activated by the last change in leadership um, in a way that we had not necessarily been before. So um, feeling like it was more and more important in our work to um, offer up some of the source materials around climate and I mean, believe it or not, there was a time when, you know, many, many years ago when we start, first started doing work about climate change when it was not really accepted the way it is now. And it's, it wasn't in the, converse, the national conversation the way it is now. And we were even more quiet about that, you know, this is really what we were looking at, these kind of shifting um, landscapes. And um, so, so I do think uh, 
you know, that, that impacted us and our work in a major way and, and how we think about our work and how we present our work to people. And I think also just to add to that, like we are, we work within a, an abstract language an abstract visual language. And we're constantly kind of thinking and mulling over how that, how that is impacted, how that works, you know, how does that um, fit into today's political climate? And, and what is that balance between um, how didactic and how, um, how kind of um, nuanced are we in our work? It's just a, it's something that we're, we're constantly thinking about and playing around with that. I mean, I, I guess uh, I'll just say, I mean, it's kind of a weird answer, but um, I mean, my, the book that I wrote, How to Do Nothing was basically like spurred by the 2016 election. Um, and that doesn't on the surface seem to have a lot to do with um, what I was doing at Recology, but I actually think that, um, that moment was sort of one in which I was trying to bring these like practices of attention that I really think like I learned a lot of at the dump um, to like myself myself and sort of, you know, uh, the task of just like being alive and okay at that time, right? Like just like, um, and so I think uh, it, you know, it was, like late 2016 was a terrible time. Um, like there was the ghost ship fire here in Oakland as well. And like, um, and I think something unexpected that happened was yeah, that those practices of attention became like a, a sort of lifeline and the book came out of the unexpected meeting of those things. So um, I think that that if, yeah, that's sort of the only real answer I have to that question. Cool, thank you all. Um, so uh, we're gonna wrap up here and we just have a few final questions from uh, us at Recology to kind of uh, ask you all the kind of framed as like lightning round questions and uh, you can go quickly, it could be brief, but uh, we're curious uh, if you can share with the audience what's next for you and perhaps maybe share uh, what you're researching slash what are you reading and then we'll, we'll unplug for the night. Um, we can, I could start. Um, we are, what am I reading? I have just recently watched a, uh, was turned on to this documentary of Dorothea Lange and um, it ended up um, purchasing her book, her catalog, The Words and Pictures, and just really um, kind of getting absorbed in the Despot migration in California in the 30s and 40s during the depression. And um, I've spent some time driving up and down 395 and the, on the east side of the Sierras and thinking a lot about the Owens River Valley and the water um, wars over there. So those are the things that are on, on my brain right now. Um, and I'll quickly say, um, I've just finished uh, the anthology, All We Can Save, uh, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. And I um, actually read it with a book group and it was, it took us, believe it or not, a year <laughs> to read it because we would go piece by piece and just really get into, anyway, I highly recommend that book. And I just wanna briefly uh, give a shout out to Round Weather Gallery in Oakland. We're in a group show there right now. It's up through May 8th and the show's focused on mapping the climate crisis. And that gallery, if you haven't been there yet, um, definitely worth a visit. It's a nonprofit where, and it's focused on, on uh, the climate crisis. Um, we're also gonna lead some outdoor talks in May at our site specific uh, public works in Dogpatch. And if you're interested in, um, signing up for these, you can go to our website um, and actually just email us and we'll put you on our mailing list for that. Mike, you wanna go next? Sure. Um, see, uh, 
what I'm reading, actually, I've been reading a lot less lately, uh, but I, I'm going to start reading How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell. <laughs> I'm probably the last one in San Francisco. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, what we're doing next is uh, we're going to be doing a lot of interviews, um, working on the film. We, we have two um, kind of video film projects. One is a short form uh, TNT side karaoke video, uh, video interviews and singing that happens in the tricycle. And then um, a kind of long game that we're trying to fundraise for is to create a, a documentary about um, Filipino, Filipino American contributions to the American landscape. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I'm working on another book. Um, at the moment, uh, and it's about time. It has another really misleading title because how to do nothing is not about how to do nothing, which makes some people really mad. Um, it, so this one's called Saving Time, but it will not help you save time. Um, and it's yeah about sort of saving different temporalities um, and climate dread, um, but also time scarcity. Um, and so I just, I everything I've been reading has lately been about leisure because I just wrote a chapter on leisure um, and like the history of segregated leisure um, and sort of the elitist idea of leisure. And so just like, yeah, everything I've been reading is about leisure. <laughs> I'm so ready to stop thinking about it um, and, uh, and, and move on to the next chapter will be about sort of like ecological time, bird migrations and stuff like that. So um, yeah, everything is, everything is time for me right now. <laughs> well, and with that, we have run out of time for tonight's talk. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for being here with us tonight. Uh, thanks to the audience. Thanks for the questions. Uh, again, thanks for Deborah, Felicia, and Elsa for helping behind the scenes with everything. So, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for inviting us. Thanks, everyone.